Welcome to Kicking That Local, the podcast all about the football community in South Australia. I'm your host, Johnny Kecko, and this week I am joined by the head coach of Western Strikers in the State League 2, Daniel Blanco. Mate, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's going to be an interesting one today because I've had an Argentinian on our show in the past, Machala Carusca, and you weren't born in Australia, I uh, weren't born, sorry, in Argentina, but you were born here in Australia, but your dad and also your eldest son were both born in Argentina. That's correct, yes. What was, uh, what's that culture like being uh, the, uh, the Argentinian background for yourself? Uh, well, it's a, it's a religion yeah. overseas, it's, uh, you know, everybody speaks about it, mums, dads, yeah. Everybody is, mm. you know, it affects your week. If your team wins, yep. you're happy for the week, and if your team loses, you're you're moping around all week until you until you play again. So, yep. it's uh, it's everything to them. Yeah, football is life over there, isn't it? It really is. It really is. is. That impacted the way you um your uh the way you take football now is a very um like cultural for you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it, it's I guess it's in the veins. Yeah, uh, you grow up with it in a. In a household that lives and breathes football, through, mm. obviously through my father, so it's something that's just in, embedded in yeah. in my brain. We're talking about um, being embedded in your brain because of your impact from your father. Your father, most might recognise the name Blanco, last name. Your dad was the coach of the Socceroos back in the late nineties. Also, assistant coach in New, um, New Zealand as well, and uh, he's he's been around for a very long time and would have had a massive impact on your life. So I want to talk about your your own career as well because you've had a big career um, nationally as also locally as well in coaching um, here in South Australia. So there's heaps to get through but I want to kick it off with your dad because your dad has coached for um, a very long time in Australia and uh, he's the coach of the Socceroos in the late 90s. Correct. What was that like to have a dad that's around those big players and the, the national team as, as a young kid for yourself? Uh, it was good. It, uh, it's a learning curve because you get to see how professionals mm. do their work. Um, you've got access to to a lot of knowledge, a lot of information, a lot of people that can teach you and show you the ways to do things that maybe other people aren't as lucky to have that opportunity. Yep. So it's uh, it was very good. It was it was a very nice experience, obviously. Yeah. At the end of the day, he is dad. Yeah. Um, and when he comes home, he's he's you know he's still someone that tells you to do what you got to do and yeah. brush your teeth and do what you got to do. But outside the house, you know that he is a bit of a, a public figure. And what was it like to your friends coming over? Because were they football fans as well? Your friends? I don't have any friends that don't do football. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that like so coming home and seeing Raul Blanco at your house? Would they ask questions all the time, or they were respectful? No, no, they were respectful. But again, they they saw him as Daniel's dad. Yeah. It was. It's different when you when you grow up with. Some Someone you don't maybe see them or give them mm. the importance that they that they deserve. I mean, looking back on it now, you go, "Wow, what a career!" Mm. But at the time, like I said, my mates they just go, "Oh, that's Daniel's dad." Yep. Same thing. So uh, look, that they were always good, and you know who your friend is because they're your friend, and you know yep. who your friend is because you're related to someone that can get you tickets to yep. to the best games. That's so, it. <laughs> you know who that is. Who the leeches are, but. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've spoken with um, Barney Smith, who was in a similar position as you. His dad was the coach of the AIS for the Golden Generation, Viduka, um, and all the others as well. So he had a very different time growing up. So what was it like for you? Was it a normal childhood, or was it very different for yourself? Uh, no, look, it, it was it was normal most of the time. Um, different, I don't know if you'd say different. Like I said, I, I had access to to watch, you know. The golden generation train or see mm. what preparation went into it or, or the conversations that was had between the coaches or like i said the planning for the olympic games and and you know world cup qualifiers you got to see what went on behind the scenes and why selections were made and why they weren't made and yep. why they chose things or you know even in fighting within mm. the players so you get to see things that aren't privy to to the public. So it was it was you know, it was fantastic, and I was lucky enough at the time to join in with a in a few training sessions when that while they were in preparation. Yeah, you enjoy it for what it's worth, I guess. When people talk about your dad being the coach and talk about those stories and those moments, do you is it proud for yourself? To- oh, absolutely. It's it's not many people can say they're related to someone that has done as much in the game yeah. as as my father has. I mean. You know, we're talking about within between Australia and New Zealand, four Olympic Games. Mm. Uh, I think it's seven World Youth Cups, one Senior World Cup, um, and being part of a process of having so many players develop under him and Les Schoenflug, uh in the national youth yeah. teams and then with Eddie Thompson in the national teams. 
you know, it's it's a privilege. It's you know, how many people can say they've done that? Yeah, it's yeah, you know, it's very very proud to to walk around and carry that surname. And how old were you at the time when he was coaching the soccer? Is do you remember? Um, that would look, Dad. I was probably about. I think I was six because the f- dad was with the World Youth Cup in 1981 in Australia at the yep. time. So that's where he started. So I was uh, I was born in 74, so I was uh, six at the time, yep. seven at the time. And then from there till uh, the year 2000 when was his Olympic Games here in Sydney. So I was probably about six till, till about 25, 26 years of age. Yep. Oh, wow. So they… A long so, time. Yep. So it's your, your early years. So that's where you remember most of your… Yeah, um, absolutely. …the memories. So the… Um, that would have shaped your life in the way you do your coaching these days as well. But what were some of the biggest names that you were hanging around? So your dad's coaches, friends, and all that kind of thing. Uh, well, Les Schoenflug is like an uncle. Yep. Robert Rassage is like an uncle. Um, and then a lot of, you know, Manfred Schaefer was a coach of mine yep. at the time. Jim Fraser uh, was goalkeeper uh, for the Socceroos in 74. I think it was part of, well, part of the squad. Um, Jimmy Rooney, all guys yep. that were from a very long time ago. And same thing. They are big names, but for me, they're just yeah. normal people because they were at the hospital when I was born, so they're just like <laughs> uncles. Yeah, like Riley Razic. When I hear that name, I'm like, the first go- the first uh, coach to take us to a World Cup, and he's, you're here just saying he's your dad's mate. <laughs> yeah, he, well, yeah, he's uh, <laughs> it's fun. I mean, it's you know to go to go even further. You know, people like Les Murray, Johnny Warren. Yeah, uh, you know, respectfully, when Johnny Warren got married the second time, Dad was the best man at his yeah. wedding. So yes. these people are just. <laughs> Obviously, they're, unfortunately, they're not not here with us now. Yeah. But they were just like normal people they're, to us. They're icons in our in our game now. But that's that's how close we were mm. with them. You know what I mean? It's like I said, Dad being the best man. It's you're pretty yeah. close to someone. So he was like an uncle as well. And he, I mean, at the time, you don't give it the relevance yeah. that it deserves because you just see them as a normal day person. But when you go out and you see how people look at them, you go, "Wow, well, yeah. they really are somebody." And now looking back on those memories, you you realize, "Geez, oh, that's who I was hanging around." Yeah, or well, hanging. I wouldn't say hanging. Well, around. not hanging around, but they, around my da- life. Yeah, they were they, they were dad's mates. Yeah. So you just like I said, if that if there was ever a dad on a, a barbecue or something like that, they would always be home, and yeah, yeah, I would sort of fleet in in and out, and yeah, may, maybe I should have, I guess, used it for more than what it than what I did. For me, it was just like yeah, just a passing thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, it was it was they were great times, and uh, look, you you have a lot of great memories from it. Yeah. Do you have your favorite moment from your dad's career? That stands out for you. Um, the favorite moments. Oh, there's 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 a lot. I guess um, most memorable. Most memorable. I uh, no, there's, there's so many to, to, to be proud of. <laughs> yeah. I, I probably uh, qualifying for the 2010 World Cup with with New Zealand. Yeah. Um, I, I know Dad had been to so many Olympic Games and, and World Youth Cups, but to actually achieve it at a senior level with another country. Yep. Um, it's probably the the proudest moment. Yeah, because unfortunately he never got that opportunity with Australia. No, it was no, like about ten years later, I think, after his time that we managed to get back in there. Yeah, that, that was part of a fair few um, mm. World Cup qualifiers. Um, unfortunately, they they just didn't get over the line. Yeah. Um, that that's football sometimes. Uh, lucky enough, uh, Ricky Herbert from from New Zealand called him up and asked yep. him to to work with him, and yeah, they were they were blessed to to be able to to qualify. Now talking about your dad's. Um your dad's friends that he grew up with and played against and played with you one of those was your first coach and he gave you your debut against your dad correct what was that moment like and uh tell me a bit about that one uh surreal i guess <laughs> um look there used to be the what used to be called the ample cup yeah um and that was uh, normally played on, on wednesday nights and it was a midweek game and i was at uh, at rpl at, at the time uh back in 1992 yeah um and got to, I was part of the squad, got to the ground, and then when Manfred announced the squad, he just just said that I was part of the starting lineup. <laughs> um, so I really didn't have much time to get, not nervous, but just be overawed by the whole situation. And back then, in the the, the early 90s, there used to be a lot of people go to the grounds yep. to watch, you know, the ethnic teams um, and so forth. So it was it was, uh, it was really good. It was uh, an honour to be selected to play in yeah. the national, well, in, in the cup to start off with, and especially against against my father's team. So it was good. What was it like for your dad to to see you 
playing in that cup against him as well. Was it a? Pr- it would have been like a. I'm oh, very weird, proud. Yeah, it would have been proud, but also a bit different, wouldn't it, for himself? Yeah, look, look, I think during the 90 minutes, yep. you know, we sort of forget that your your dad and son, yep. you just sort of want to beat them, um, maybe a little bit more than uh, than <laughs> usual. But you know, during those 90 minutes, you're not enemies, but you're yep. you know you you clash, and then. Uh, after it's all done, uh, the funny thing is we actually went to the game together. Yep. Um, I didn't have my license at the time, so we drove in <laughs> yeah. together. The game finished and then we drove back home together because yep. I was living at home at the time. So, um, yeah, for those 90 minutes, it was uh, you know, obviously a very proud moment for, for the family. How did the game pan out? Uh, to all. To all. <laughs> to all. Can't forget that result. Uh, it was to all. Um, I played 70, about 75 minutes, 76 minutes from, yep. from memory. Um, and it was good. It was yeah. just really, really good. So the car, the car ride home. What was that like? Uh, it was funny. It was trying to <laughs> tell him that we were better and we should have won, and he was telling me that they were better and should have won. So it was, uh, it was good. I mean, I, I was lucky that in in that regard, they would always try to help me yeah. despite playing for for a different team. Um, so look, I, I was. Uh, yeah, it was a very, very nice moment. What was the rest of your playing career like? Um, because you you played uh, uh you didn't really play here in South Australia but you played most of your career in New South Wales. Yes. What was that like um over there playing your career in Yeah, it was good. Well, uh, unfortunately when when I was at Apia the that year finished and Apia went broke. Yep. Um in the old National Soccer League. Uh so I had to leave like all well, the whole club mm. virtually disbanded. Uh from there I went to Parramatta Melita and that year dad left Parramatta to come to West Adelaide. Yep. Um, and Rella Rasic was a coach at, at Parramatta Malira at the time. Um, so it was uh, played there uh, on and off for two years, and then after that I sort of attitude issues, you could say, on, yeah. on my behalf, sort of went and played uh, what well, used to be, it's called the NPL now, it used to be the State League yep. uh, back in Sydney and sort of uh, kept playing at that level. What was So now you've got that experience of playing in the State League, but now you're coaching in South Australia's NPL. What is the difference of level? Because I know it's a bit of a, the the gap between years is massive, but and things have changed over the years. But what, in your comparison, what was it like over there to hear what we've got now here in South Australia? I just think Sydney, the fact that they've got a bigger population means you've got more players to choose from. Yeah, I think here you're a bit. I want to say it's a hindrance, but you know that certain players, if someone's not performing, you don't have three players behind him waiting to take his spot. Yeah. In Sydney, obviously, you know a lot more people, a lot more players, so there's a lot more competition for spots, which makes the competition at a higher level just because there's competition amongst themselves. Yeah. I don't think we've got a range of players here that were pushing other players as hard as they should do because of numbers. Mm. So that would make it, that's what, you, in your belief, that's what, that's all it is. Yeah. I think there's a lot of lot of talented players in South Australia. I think yeah. there's many, many talented players. I don't think there's uh, – if you say, for instance, there's 100 talented players in, in New South Wales, maybe Adelaide has 50. Yeah. And that's where the I think the biggest difference is that you don't have enough players pushing the better players here to get them to the next level. Extra leagues, extra elite teams, is that what, what would build that up? Because we got from – we've got three, three uh, tiers in the men's competition. Yes. But then after that's amateurs. So if there were more tiers after State League Two, which is I know it's difficult because a lot of clubs struggle to to compete in those leagues. But what would it be um, the the ideal situation to try and build it up? More league, more teams, or not? Yeah, really? I, look, I'm I'm a fan of of more games. Yep. So I think each each league should have you know, fourteen to sixteen teams. Yeah, I think a lot of players will complain about that, but the only way you're going to get better is to play more games. Yep. Um, you know, I, I don't think a 22-season competition, I mean, that you know, for this 52 weeks to the year, I, I know there's pre-season and some teams will play semi-finals and so forth, but all up you may play in total 30 games, 35 games. Mm. That means you're almost for 20 weeks doing nothing. How are you meant to get better, you know, if you're not playing or training or improving your craft? I don't think we train enough. I don't think we do enough. Yeah. Um, so to say more teams would be ideal, but yep. if you don't have the talent base and then there's a blowout in scores and teams are winning, beating others 7 or 8 nil, then it kind of defeats the purpose as well. Do you think most clubs will be able to handle more games? Because volunteers, it's, it's a lot of struggles already to try and find volunteers to help. Do you reckon it could be a little bit of a struggle to try and oh, get there? Of course. Look, look it's, it's, it's very hard. I mean, mm. we're talking perfect scenario here. That yeah. We've got, you know... 50 volunteers and so forth. Normally when you go to, to any game, you always see the same volunteers at the canteen yep. or cleaning up or pulling the nets down. And I don't think they get enough recognition for mm. what they do. And they do it 
for free and they yeah. do it out of their spare time and they do it because they're just wonderful people. To ask them to do more than what they're currently doing, yes. that would be awfully difficult. Yeah. Um, I'm talking perfect world scenario. Yeah. It would be uh, amazing if we could yeah, get more volunteers or even get them paid or something to that would reimburse be ideal. them a little bit. Absolutely. Hopefully, in the next 20 years, let's, let's uh, hope so. Let's <laughs> we hope can so. get there so we can get more games of football here in South Australia. But talking about your career back in uh, in New South Wales, you ended it and then you went back to Argentina where your dad was born and you spent your, a little bit of your early childhood up there as well. What was that experience to go back there? And did, Was there any playing or any football-related things um, over for you? No, I just went on a holiday. Yep. Ended up staying for, for a few years. Uh, that was originally meant to be a, a short holiday. Yep. Um, but again, you, you live and breathe every weekend. You're going mm. to the games. You're always seeing a lot of things. I, again, I'm, I'm lucky through dad that I had access to watch a lot of the of the best teams in Argentina train. Yeah. Um, so it was a real learning curve to see, for instance, Boca Juniors River Plate train because I had access to that. Yeah. Um, but no, I wasn't. I wasn't involved there. I was just a spectator there more than yep. anything else. What was the capacity of like the what you got to see and stuff there at the Boca Juniors? In terms of the, the game, people at the game? Yeah, well, no, what, yourself, when you got the access through your dad, what, what kind of things did you get to experience and see? Uh, again, just how, well, I guess more than anything, how cutthroat it is. Yeah. Here we've got teams that say, for instance, on the 15s team here, we'll have 15 players and little Johnny needs to play 23 minutes and mm. little Freddie needs to play 42 minutes and it needs to balance out throughout the course of the year. Over there, it's not like that. They've got 25, 30 players to a team. And if you're not in the best 15, 16 players in the squad Jeez. for that weekend, unlucky, it is what it is. You need to work harder. You need to train harder. You need to be better. Is that what instills that that um, the different work ethic there with the kids? Because they, they know if they're not good enough, they're not going to get a spot. So they train harder and kind of... Absolutely. And not only that, it's 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 a pathway for a lot of them to survive. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the kids come from you know really poor backgrounds yep uh they need to catch two buses to get to training to train to get the training it's it's very hard but the family knows that if you know the the son makes it then that's their way out you know carlos tevez as a a perfect example you know comes from a very poor background and he was the one that was feeding all his family his uncles and his cousins and so forth it is what it is here you know like i said your son doesn't play doesn't make it oh no worries i can go and buy him you know new golf clubs and he can take up golf yeah in Argentina, you don't have that luxury. You either play football and make it or make something of yourself or, you know, you struggle mm. to survive and you live in poverty. It's almost like, it is like life. It is life. Yeah. It is life. Because like I said, it's it's your way out. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's other avenues, but for 90% of the population, playing football is their way out of, out mm. of you know, the life that they're in. When you went over there, you that's the period where you had your first son? Yes. What was that? Was that uh, expected to go over there and have a son born in Argentina? Uh, no, no. Well, I, um, when I was over there, I, I got married. Yeah. Um, so obviously through that, uh, my, my first son yep. was born, and then uh, realised that at the time that it's you know Australia's a better country with mm. a, with a brighter future for our kids than what Argentina would be. So we decided to to make the trip home. Yeah, that's cool. You got the Argentinian. Like even though you weren't born there, but now you got a dad and your son are both yeah, born. A bit of uh, Argentinian <laughs> flavour. Yeah. That's cool. And then, then you came back to Australia to continue your life here for a better uh, lifestyle. You got into coaching. Yes. What was that like to get back into that, into football again, but at a coaching level now and almost being in the footsteps of your dad? Uh, yeah, it was good. It, it's kind of funny because if if you're half decent, the guy is exactly like his father. <laughs> and if you're no good, the guy is nothing like his father. So <laughs> yeah. I mean, I kind of like no win situation here. Um Coaching obviously is different when you're when you're a player. You just worry about yourself. Yeah. Um, coaching, you got to worry about 15, 16 players, and a first grade level, even more players. Mm. Um, you have to worry about personalities. A lot of these players work. What mood they're in? Have they had a good day? Had a bad day? Have they had you know problems with their partners at mm. home? There's so many things that you need to juggle to ensure that everybody's you know happy. How do you deal with the comparisons to your dad? Because it's going to happen naturally. Because your dad was on the world stage. He coached for many many years and had some successful years as well. But what was that like for you to deal with that comparison every single time? If even if you like you said good bad, you're always getting compared to him. No, it's fine. I've I've, yeah. I've learned to live with it all my life. Yep. Basically, so even as a player, you know, um, you get to live with you know, are you playing because your Real Blanca son, and that's why, I, unfortunately, I was never coached by him at a club level. Yep. Um, for that simple fact that I never want to be told that I was playing somewhere because yep. he was a coach. Um, but comparisons, I, I think it's, I'm I'm super proud that I'm compared to him because what better person to be compared to that someone that's done so much in the game? Mm. So I'd rather be compared to someone 
like him, they're not being compared at all. Yeah. Well, did you talk to your dad before you got into coaching to get some inspiration? Always. I, I, I speak to dad on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, normally, first thing once I'm on my way to work, first call in the car is, is to dad yep. to see how he's doing. Um, and then he'll always ask, you know, how was training, what happened? And I, you know, I always bounce ideas off him too. Yeah. And he sees things from a different level. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't mean that I always follow what he says, but he gives me a great insight into you know, a different way of doing things. What's some of the things you've learned from your dad, from his coaching that you've taken into the way you do things now? Uh, how to deal with, uh, you know, heated moments in the in the middle of a game. Yep. How to read the situation in the game when, you know, everything's going crazy about you, everybody's in the heat of the battle and, you know, things might not be going your way. It's how to just be cold in the moment and analyse the game and, and not make a decision based on emotions. Yeah. Because sometimes you go, oh, you know, this play isn't doing well and you get angry and you get upset with a certain player and you make a rash decision because you're emotional. It's about just being ice cold at the time and, and trying to analyse what's best for the team at the time and not letting the emotion take over for mm. you. Well, that's a good one because a lot of coaches do get revved up and then just... Oh, look, that, that, don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm as vocal as, as they come, sometimes yeah. too vocal. Um, but in saying that, when I make a, a sub or a change, I think that I try to be as as, as mm. calm and collected as possible. Obviously, I, I have a, a great assistant in, in Mario Caruso who, who you know we discuss things with. Yep. Um, but yeah, you try to be as, as, as ice cold as you possibly can. Mm. So you got your first coaching experience in Mount Drew in, uh, in the state who now are in the MPL in uh, New South Wales. Yes. But in South Australia, your first opportunity to coach was the, at West Adelaide. Correct. Which is to your family, very close to your family because that's where your dad coached for 110 games there in the NSL. So what was that like to, to go to the club that your dad was... Uh, like heavily involved. Oh, in. it's it's an honour to coach at a at, at a club um, like West Adelaide with yeah. the history that they have. Yeah. Um. Yeah. When you, when you talk about Adelaide football and and no disrespect to to anybody else, Adelaide City, West Adelaide are the two biggest clubs. Yeah. Um. So to come here and coach at one of those at one of those teams is you know was, was a great honour. Um. Lucky enough to be given a chance to coach the under 18s there. Um. Yeah. Blessed that that we that we won the league and then won the the grand final. Mm. So, it was a it was a I guess a great introduction to to football in Adelaide. That was so in that first year it was in 2018. They were in the NPO at that stage. Correct. They're not anymore. They've unfortunately they're just gone down a level a bit. Yes. But hopefully we can see them build back up. Yes. Because we all love to see a strong West Adelaide and also Absolutely. a strong Adelaide City as well. But. In that in that period, you got the minor premiership and also the grand final. Yes. In that first year. Yes. How challenging was that for you to do that? Or was what was it like? Uh, it was very challenging. It's uh, obviously I have my ways and my methods, um, and a lot of it is obviously mm. from a Sydney base as well. Um, and it took a bit of time for the players, possibly the parents, to adjust to to my ways. Yeah. Uh, luckily, the results went our way, and, and and again, the the boys were fantastic, so they deserve all the credit for for following the instructions. And uh, yeah, I, I can't thank them enough for for obviously giving me a, a championship. Did the comparisons come in about your dad and yourself? Absolutely. Well, yeah, especially <laughs> at a couple like West Adelaide. Obviously, they're thinking, oh, he, yeah. you know, he could he possibly be one day our, our first grade coach. Um, fortunately, it wasn't to be, but that's um, look, that's that's football, and, and uh, we move on. Next couple of years, there you did um, coach the reserves. Yes. So you went straight up to reserve the next, the following year. Correct. And uh, semi-finals and all, two semi-finals uh, appearances. Correct. How was that uh, that next level up? What was that challenge like for you and uh, preparing you for the future? Uh, good. Uh, look, reserve grades is is always very hard for any coach because you're you're sort of dictated by what the first grade coach wants. Yeah. Um, that he gives you players, you send him players, mm. that, you know, last minute, I need extra players for training and so forth. So you try to mould the team as, as best as you can. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's good because it makes you think quickly and sometimes you get to training and you've got a training session planned in your head and all of a sudden they say to you, three players need to get into first grade. Yeah. Or they're sending you down three players. So you need to adjust for the numbers that you've got planned. So it it, uh, it teaches you to think real quick and, and real fast on, on how to adjust the training session. What do you think of that concept of like that template of having the reserves as backup for the uh, seniors? Do you reckon that's the, the right way it's should be uh this should it should be set out that oh absolutely i think so well look, the, all the players in, in reserve grade need a pathway sometimes unfortunately mm. there are players that are 
that are that are too good for reserve grade but not good enough for first grade, just that little bit off. Um, and reserve grade is probably the best place for them to hone their skills yep. to be ready. And as a reserve grade coach, you need to make them ready for the next step. Yep. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's a, it's perfect for them. Can it hinder the other players in the squad that want to play better and then they work well with someone else, but then the next week they're playing seniors and now they've got to adjust? Can that affect their... Um, to a degree, I think it also it teaches them the same way it teaches a coach to adjust yep. quickly. It teaches them to adjust with different players, different skill sets. Yeah. Um, and when you get into first grade, same thing. You know, you got players that some are better than others, or some have got a different skill set to others. Yeah. So the quicker you learn to play with different players and understand what their attributes are, yeah, I think the the better you are. I love the reserves and all that because a lot of A League teams don't didn't have reserves for a very long time. Yes. So I think it's great, but I just love to see the different. Um, well, from a, the perspective of a reserves coach and what it's like with the challenges of uh, dealing with losing play each week because you wouldn't get that in a senior role. No, you, well, <laughs> well, you, you do. Well, that's yeah, the thing. You, you do. Way, but I mean, yeah, you get injury different. suspensions. Yeah. You know, players leave. Um, but reserve grade, look, you, normally you've got the core bulk of players that are your team. Mm. Um, and, and again, like I said, I think everybody just sort of learns on the run what they need to do. So, uh, look, I, I think it's a fantastic learning curve for them. And after that, you went. You didn't get your break as a senior coach. No. Did what was the, the ending bit? Um, what was the thing that ended it with your time at West Adelaide? Uh, was it mutual? No. Oh, look, it was. Let's just say they had a different path that yep. they thought they were wanted to go through, and I had a different path as well. Yep. Um, oh, look, I, I wish the club nothing but the best. I, I, I'm a West Adelaide fan yep. through and through. I, I, I hope they get promoted this year. They're doing well and I, I truly believe that they've got a great chance of, of doing that. I always, like you, want to see the best teams in the in the yep. MPL. We just had a difference of opinion. I think that's, without saying too much, I think that's the best way to, to mm. leave it. Yep, fair enough. And uh, did you ever cross paths with the other Argentinian great at West Adelaide with Marcelo Caldrisco or was it just... Yeah, um, the, when I was uh, the last year that we were in MPL, Marcelo was at, uh, he was one of the senior players, he had just come on board and I was in in, uh, in the reserve grade squad as a coach. Um, and Marcelo, about halfway through the year, um, through injuries, couldn't play yeah. anymore. Um, and I used to ask him all the time to come and, and help me out uh, and put on some training sessions for us because yeah. I, I think he's... You know, his world of knowledge. We're talking about a, mm. a real superstar of the game. He's uh, he's fantastic, and he's and he's so humble. You yeah. know, there's just he's just a fantastic human being. So, I was blessed to to meet one of the the greats. Do you have a close contact with him? Because he's yes. both Argentinian background. Uh, look, we we speak. Uh, you know, we we don't speak every week. We yeah. we speak. You know, often enough, he'll call me. I'll call him, or, yeah. or we'll get together for a coffee. Um, yeah, when, when Tom allows it, obviously during football, it's really hard because he's got his academy and I've got my mm. coaching. So the times that you do have off, you kind of want to spend it yeah. with your family as well. I'm sure he does as well. But when whenever there's an opportunity to, to get together, absolutely. No, he's one of the greats and uh, we're very privileged to have him here in South Australia. His absolutely. academy are producing some really good kids in football. So hopefully we can see a next generation come through there and see some new A-League stars coming out of Adelaide. Oh, I have no doubt. Like, like I said, he, he's he's a fantastic human and, and he's and he's great with kids mm. um, and with his knowledge and, and the way he prepares the players. And when you watch his teams play, you know, they're just a really good team to watch. And, yeah. and again, he's, you know, it, it's a, it's not a process of one year. You know, it's it's a long time that you've got mm. to get everybody on the same page and he's, and he's doing that. It's going to be good. And uh, he, well, comes from... Playing with Carlos Tevez and uh, what was what's it like in Argentina? Is he well known over there? Or? Oh, absolutely. Well, look, people think Carlos Tevez, but he, he played in for a team called Estudiantes. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, over 150 games, if I'm not mistaken. And you know, he, he played. You know, we're talking. Then he got sold, uh, if I recall correctly, to a team in Turkey. Played Champions League game mm. at Anfield against Liverpool. Um, you know, we're talking about a superstar here. We're not mm. talking about someone that sort of played second division. No, no, we're talking about a guy that's played at the highest level in Argentina against Boca Juniors, against River Plate. Yep. You know, we're talking about best of the best here. Absolutely. Now he's involved in Vipers FC, who were in State League 2, who's yes. now your um, opposition in yes. State League 2 because you're a head coach now for yes. Western Strikers. Yes. What's it like for you to be uh, a head senior head coach now of a team in the State League 2? It's a great honour. Uh, I've got to thank uh, the board of directors for entrusting me with yeah. with the role. Um, I was at Western Strikers last year, uh, halfway through the year. Um, the coach at the time, Mauro Di Marco, uh, gave me a chance to, to be his assistant coach. Um, unfortunately, we got relegated, but the the club I think saw hopefully saw enough in me to 
think that I could do something to help them get back up into Division 1. What's it like being the head coach of a team that's just been relegated to a, the, the, the bottom level in South Australia in uh, the elite football? But what's it like to now to change that mentality and as a coach and try and fight to get back up or even just even make finals? Uh, look, it's, it's a challenge because, you know, at the end of the year, we lost a lot of players. Um, mm. So you've got, almost got to rebuild from scratch again. Um, we lost, yeah, I think, seven or eight players, you know, combined five, six hundred games experience. Um, and then, you know, we're trying to bring in a, a core group of players or a younger core group of players with not even a third of experience of what these boys have. So yep. it's it takes some time. It's a process. We started this year not the best. Um, thankfully, now we're, we're going on a, on a great run at the moment of, I think it's like 10 games un, yep. undefeated. So the boys are slowly beginning to, to piece it all together and we've got some some great experienced boys like Adrian Delfonso, Joe Tripodi and, and so forth uh, helping us out to, you know, the experienced boys to guide these younger boys along. So, look, I, I think we're in good shape at the moment. There's a long way to go still. What's some of the hurdles you've got to get over to um, to see success when you're a club that's just been relegated? Probably attracting players that are willing to play State League 2. Yep. Everybody wants to play and coach as high as they possibly can. Yep. So trying to, you know, why would a player come to a State League team to State League 2 team when they can stay at a State League 1 team or an NPL team? Yep. It's got to be more than just that. There's got to be, you know, a path or I guess a pathway for them to improve their football, facilities at the club, what the club's trying to do, what they're trying to achieve, how they treat the players. So you need to sell yourself or mm. sell the club really well to, to be able to get them across. A lot of coaches come in for different reasons. Some are there to win the championship that year. Some are there for the long run to build um, a, a new like a new um, culture at the club. And uh, some are there just to make finals. What is your role um, when you came into the club? Is there any specific or...? Well, to get back up as soon as possible. Yeah, basically. Um, whilst we try to get up as soon as possible back into into Division One, being so many new players, you try to build something for the yep. long term. Obviously, building long term makes it a lot easier when you're winning games and you get promoted. Yeah. Um, so then, obviously, the committee has a bit more faith in what you're doing. Um, so, look, the, the the ultimate goal is to get promoted again this year, mm. if possible. You come from West LA, a, gr- a traditional Greek club. Western Strikers got a t- Italian roots there as well with um, playing at the Veneto Club back in the early days. Gianni Lestella, the president of the club, yes. we spoke um, on this show and uh, we spoke about what it was like as a kid for himself. What's it like for you being a part of that culture at Western Strikers personally? Uh, look, it's great. It, I'm Again, being in, in the state only four and a bit years, it's it's kind of hard to know a lot of the club's history. Yep. Um, this year they've got their their forty year um, anniversary, the gala dinner. It was actually two years ago, but obviously through COVID yep. and, and and so forth, we weren't able to have it. Um, but it goes to show you, forty years. Not every club's been around for forty years, so I think it's a great achievement from where they are mm. or where they were to where they are now. Um, yeah, I, I think I think sometimes we forget where the club was to where it is today. Um, and all the great players that have come through the club and all the great players Mm. that, you know, and we've been able to attract the fair few players that were at the club before to come back. So obviously the club's done right by them for them to want to come back and help us get out of the situation that we're in at the moment. Where do you think the club's heading at this stage? The way you see it now, where where, do you think it's heading? I think it's great. I think it's, um, look, obviously we didn't want to get relegated, but sometimes when you do, it sort of makes you rethink Mm. things or or start from scratch or, or... go over mistakes that maybe you've made to make sure you don't do them again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've been blessed that the committee's been right behind us and everything that I've asked for, they've been able to provide. So um, they're on this path with us. And from what I know, without saying too much, I think we're, we're on onto something really good here. And it is only your first year as a head coach of a senior team. What Are you still ironing out certain things within yourself from learning from your first year? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's things that I'm doing this year that I'm sure I won't do again next year and, and the year after and so forth. It's mm. Again, it's a constant evolution of, of who I am as a, as a coach and as a person to, to try to better myself. Um, yeah, obviously we're all looking for continuous improvement. Yeah. So that's I'm, I'm no different. And how would you compare you with NPL um, in the reserves a few years back, a couple of years back? Now you're in the uh, seniors of State League 2, so three divisions apart. Or not three, there's one in between, but... 
top uh, thir- first and third division. So how do you um, compare the reserves in the NPL back then to the seniors in State League Two now? Look, I, I th- well, look, a lot of the players at the moment that are playing in State League Two are a lot of those players that were in NPL reserve grade. Yep. Um, I just think that the NPL players are better for the fact that they're surrounded or their environment is a lot better. Mm. So if they get called up into, say, an Adelaide City first-grade squad, they're being coached by a Paul Pezos or by a Barney Smith. So mm. the coaching is a lot better. The environment's a lot better. The players are a lot better. So you get better yourself just because of the environment that you're in. Yeah, big drop, though. It, it, can... it is a drop. Yeah. But, but look, there's there's still a lot of tons of players playing in NPL yeah. too that... Uh, or State League 2 that you think to yourself well this, I think this kid could play higher than what mm. he's playing at the moment and for whatever reason work, commitments or whatever yeah. it is isn't or because of loyalty to the club but there's still a lot of very good players in State League 2 and uh, with doing all this as well you're, you've are you obviously it's a big big commitment to be a coach of a, a senior team so many nights of training how do you manage to do that juggle that and also be with your family as well uh, I'm lucky that uh, I'm with a wonderful woman. Yeah, uh, she's uh, she's very understanding. She's very supportive. Uh, she's probably my number one supporter. So uh, if I didn't have her by my side, yep. um, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. So I, I guess all all the success, if you want, mm. if you want to call it that, is down down to her. Is she from here or for? Yeah, uh, she's yeah. Uh, she's an Adelaide girl. Uh, she's a Greek girl. She's uh, her name's Connie. Um, funnily enough, her father used to come watch West LA when dad was coaching okay. there. And, and it's funny, she used to hear dad's name mentioned on at the yeah. dinner table all the time. Um, so yeah, it's uh, kind of a small world that all of a sudden I'm I'm with her now. What was the family like when you met them and they found out you were Raul Blanco's son? Um, <laughs> no, look, I guess no. they're indifferent. I mean, yeah. uh, unfortunately, uh, Connie's dad's not with us anymore, yeah. um, which is a shame. But uh, yeah. The mother, I don't think, cared too didn't much. Care. No. <laughs> she couldn't care less, no. Fair enough. Um, but you also got your sons. Are he actually uh, watching you record this now? What's it like to have them? And now also one of them uh, playing. <laughs> They're just uh, loving it. Um, the little mention there for him. What, uh, what's it like seeing them play as well for um, Western Strikers as well? Oh, look, very proud as well. Obviously, um, watching them grow um, yeah. into the young men they are and, and seeing how committed they are. And, and I guess I hope I can have an effect on them the way my father did on me, that yep. they see what it takes and the hours that go on behind the scenes um, to to make it as a, as a player. Yep. So, uh, look, they're only young, um, long, long way ahead, but uh, hopefully they're learning the, the right yeah. traits. Do, do we get them on? Oh, we'll quickly get them on and uh, we'll speak to both of you. But, mate, your dad um, is a coach now. You're playing for the uh, Western Strikers. What's it like for you? Uh, what? What was your name again? Though? Um, Joaquin. Joaquin. It's yeah. an Argentinian name. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, Spanish, but um, you know, my mum uh decided to name me after an Argentinian singer that she yep. really liked. Um, so yeah, I'm stuck with his name now. Uh, but I don't <laughs> mind it. Um, yeah, it's good. And your little brother Sebastian as well. Uh, I don't know why my mum named me Sebastian, but she just did name me <laughs> Sebastian. It, it's just suitable for uh both languages, uh yeah. Spanish and uh English. Um, yeah, so. beautiful. What do you like? Do you like playing for Western Strikers as well? Um, yeah, it's a really uh, it is a good club. I really like my coach. Um, you know he's young, yep. so he's still learning, but um. I like his mentality, like you have to work hard, you need yep. to do this, you need to do that. And it really suits how I play the game and, um, you know, how I work and all that. So, yeah, I do enjoy it. And you're only 14 years old? Um. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, you, you do you want to play soccer for full time? Is that your goal? I don't know. Um, you know, I'm thinking like, do I go to uni? Do I play soccer? So, I really don't know what to stick to. Um, yeah, that's right. He's still young, got a long way to go. You can just enjoy it for now. That's the main thing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I've had some um, debuts with the uh, 18, 18s, um, oh, Western wow. Strikers. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, I see if my dad can help me. Uh, obviously, I'd <laughs> rather be a soccer player than get up early in the morning every day and work oh. in an office. But, uh, yeah. Beautiful. And what's it like having your dad? Because he said he had his dad what, uh, playing uh, coaching. What was it like seeing your dad coach now? Um. It's really enjoyable um, because I watch all of his games because, like, um, you know, he's trying to win the league. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's really intense moments. Uh, you know, yesterday yesterday he had a draw, um, which was unfortunate. But it was just yeah. – it's really good to watch because you learn a thing or two, um, especially from a great man like him. <laughs> you know, you, you get to learn. Um, and, yeah, you take that with you. 
on there you go. Three generations of Blanco, hopefully, in the uh, the football community in Australia. And what about you, Sebastian? Do you play as well? Oh, uh, yeah, I do play. Yeah? What do you, um, what's your position? Uh, usually, I play striker or wingers yeah? or top. Never, I don't play in defence often at all. Uh, once <laughs> I played with Joaquin and I did hit the post. <laughs> uh, it was very unfortunate, but I did enjoy playing with them. <laughs> Uh, you talk very well. What about your dad? Do you like um, having your dad as a coach? Not yeah, your coach, but as a coach? Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> because like the good thing is going 10 weeks unbeatable is great, having your yeah. father as a coach like that. And climbing up from 11th place to 4th place is just amazing. Do you, wanna, um, do you guys want to be a coach one day yourself? Uh, no, nah, soccer player. I feel yeah. like... Just football. <laughs> I feel like maybe I can... Um, you know, my dad does teach me a lot of things, and when I play my games, he says, Joaquin, you can do this better, or you could do this, but you're doing this well, so you should keep doing it. Um, but, you know, everything that he says, it, it always sticks in, and um, I always learn from it. Yeah. And, yeah, I really enjoy it. Oh, I think I might be. You never know. That's it. We're only 14, and you're also 10, Sebastian, so you've got a long, long way to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll get your dad back on now. Thank you for joining me, boys. <laughs> I think you my youngest uh, little uh, interviews I've had on this show. So there we go, debuts. <laughs> they absolutely love it. But Daniel, it's good to see uh, you're the next generation of the Blanco family are uh, very passionate about the game as well. Yeah, well, yeah, I guess uh, when uh, when they're with me, it's uh, it's uh, it's football nonstop, twenty four yeah. hours a day. So yeah, I I would hope that uh, it rubs off on them. How proud are you to see them coming through the ranks as well now, playing the game and hopefully. Uh, Getting to a a, a a full time, it's not a full time, but the senior level. Oh, very proud. Uh, like I said, it's it's a it's still a long path yeah. for where they need to be. Um, but the fact that uh, they're playing at the club that I'm coaching is uh, is very nice. Yeah, how proud was it to see them behind the mic as well? Oh, very proud. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> it was good. No, it was, it's good to have them on. And I think they're my youngest. They actually are my youngest uh, guests on the show. There you go. <laughs> and they're very proud of that moment as well. But um, now, thank you for joining me, Daniel. It's thank great you. to learn about yourself and also. Um, about your kids as well, about uh, what they they love uh, about the game, and also to learn about your dad as well, because we all know about the uh, the national team, and uh, most people know in the football community about your dad. Uh, but it's good to hear from your point of view and uh, to see how it's uh, affected you and helped you f to where you are today. No, I appreciate the time and uh, and thank you for for being interested in my story. No, always interested in the local game because that's the. Our community, we've got these great um, people involved in our game here in South Australia, and it's just, we need to highlight them. Absolutely. And before I let you go, I want to do a couple of uh, kicking that questions I do with every single guest. Um, so the first f first one of those two are, uh, who would you like to kick it with on a park? Anyone in the world? Dead or alive? Dead or alive. Anyone. Can be anyone. You can bring them back. You've got the magic powers to bring them back if you want. Uh, <laughs> Ronaldo Nazario. Okay. Why is that any reason? behind that choice uh no uh, I, well maradona was my favorite player of all time mm. yeah wearing a maradona jumper yes <laughs> and i was uh, lucky enough to to train with him a couple of times so oh, wow. i won't uh, i won't put him as because i've already done that so my probably my second favorite player of all time would yeah. be would be uh, ronaldo nazario how did the maradona um training come come about uh back in 93 australia uh, played argentina world cup qualifier oh. uh, and at the time the argentina squad uh came out and uh it was the only Argentinian-based players at the time, and they needed four or five players who were playing well Argentinian background at the mm. time to train with them. Uh, Chichi Mendes, Pablo Cardozo, myself, and, and a few others were lucky enough to 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 be asked wow. to train with them. Wow, that's incredible! So that didn't even know that you did that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you tell many people that story? Or uh, no, not really. Oh, like some, some of my friends know about it, yeah. obviously, and I've got photos at home with it and yeah. so forth. But like, unless, unless no. What was he like to to play with him? I don't. I don't think I, I have words. Or yeah. I mean, we're we're all footballers, and you all think you can play. Yeah. But yeah. then when you see him do certain things, you just. Was he a nice guy to be around? Yeah. Look, he, he was. You know, at the end of, of training, we all were able to take photos and get autographs and so forth. Mm. And there was there was no issues. He, he wasn't great with the journalists when they wanted to ask him questions, yeah. but with all the other players, he was always yeah amazing. And he's like God. So for you, with your background, yes, as you well, could say that. Yeah. <laughs> To be able to see him and uh, and play with him as well, an unbelievable uh, moment. But the other one, the second one is, who would you love to kick it with on a Saturday night and watch some football with? So two people to so kick it with, like to relax on a Saturday night, watch some football. Two people, someone international, someone locally. You can bend the rules. You can do whatever you want. Everyone does. My dad. Your dad. Yep. My dad. 
So he'll be the local one to to sit with. Who else would you love international? Would you love to bring Man- Marcelo like- Bielsa? Yeah, Marcelo Bielsa. Nice. The was coaching at Leeds up until not long ago. Yep. Um, I just love the way he he interprets the game, how he wants his teams to play, uh, an aggressive, attractive, you know, non-stop, high energy tempo type of game. Um, and when you talk about the best coaches in the world at present, yep. they all look at him as one of the major yep. guys. You talk about Guardiola, Guardiola says that Bielsa is the best. You know, yep. Conte looks at him, Zidane looks at him. So he's got to be doing something right. So yep. he'd be someone I'd love to just, just sit there and see how his brain works and how he analyzes games. And then also your dad as well. Yes. So they're both of them on the couch together watching football. That would be ideal, yes. Yeah. Who would you love? Any Any particular game, maybe a World Cup? Yeah, or just just any game, just yep. for them to dissect it and just. I mean, I mean, like I said, I've, I've done that with my father a lot of times. Yeah. But with Bielsa, would be just to see, you know, yeah. how his brain works. Do you get to get to hang with your dad a bit and watch football and uh, any particular games? Or? Yeah, look now, now that I've moved to to Adelaide, it makes it a lot more difficult. I yep. still get to to Sydney probably yeah, four or five times a year. Yep. Um, so no, yeah, not not as often as I'd like. But when I am in Sydney and and if the A League is is on at the time, we'll definitely sit down and we'll watch a game. Do you um love watching the World Cup with him as well? Because he used to coach Australia, New Zealand, yeah, but yeah. also the background of Argentina as well. Yeah, yeah. Look, it's um I th- I, th- I can't remember the last time I watched a World Cup with Dad, but uh, yeah, look, it, it, just any game is yeah. is great to watch with him. Now, awesome. As I love getting these uh, backgrounds of people because you get to learn what uh, certain things we can talk all day, but finding out who you want to spend time with is a, a really a great question because you get to hear different stories and different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, thank you so much for joining me and uh, all the best with your coaching career. Thank it's you so much. the beginning of your senior it is. coaching career. So hopefully there's uh, a lot more championships coming your way and uh, hopefully promotion as well. Let's hope so. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That was the head coach of the Western Strikers in the State League 2, Daniel Blanco and his two little kids, Sebastian and Joaquin. Make sure you subscribe to Kicking It Local wherever you get your podcasts so you can get a taste of the SA football community. Plus, follow at Kicking It Local SA on Instagram and Twitter so you don't miss any of the action. See you soon.